my talk, my talk for Grand Rounds today is Trauma and Embolization. My name is Ryan Arbo, I'm one of the R4s for those who don't know me. All right. I was expecting applause, but that, that's all right. Don't worry about it. We'll get it later. Um, so, start with a couple of cases here. Um, first case this is a case I was involved with a couple of years ago. It's a 54 year old male. Uh, as a motorcycle driver, he was wearing a helmet. Uh, this was out in front of Vic. He collided with a pickup truck turning left at a light. You're going city speeds, uh, paramedics arrived, they did a scoop and run, show up um, in the department, GCS3, oxygen applied, is in a C-spine collar. Doran, what do you want to do? All right, collided, GCS3, oxygen applied, signal monitors, IV access, um, oxygen. You basically want to activate the trauma team. You want to activate trauma team right away? Well, I mean, we got a pretty big mechanism of injury. He's significantly injured. He's been hit by a truck, pickup truck on a motorbike, GCS3. He's by a collar, so he's not responsive. Is he intubated? No, scoop and run. Probably consider intubating the patient, just yeah. based on the GCS and sure his airway is, is secure. Um, okay, so now you're on trauma team, and uh, he comes in, blood pressure 70 on 40. His heart rate's 95, we don't have a SAT, it's not reading, and he's being bagged. So I think we have a fluid resuscitation, I want to get blood ready, uh, fast scan, um, look for obviously you know, primary, secondary surveys, obviously, we want to be doing those. See if we can find any sources of bleeding, significant injury other than the head injury. Um, Sean, ABCs. Yeah, so we have airway, we've intubated the patient. You intubated him? Yeah. With breathing, right? We have IV access, fluids, and blood pending, correct? Yeah. So, no, no, no. no one's going to argue with the trauma team activation if you hear that's coming in. Mm -hmm. So, I agree with you. I didn't argue either, I just wanted you to say why. So, would you intubate him just about anything, or would you give him anything to help you intubate him? Uh, if he's got a significant head injury, you don't want to be running the risk of increasing his ICP, so you'd want to consider doing something there. So maybe like a Tomidate, I don't think. Blood pressure was 70. 70. Would you use paralyzing? Um, I don't know if it would be necessary. Well, I don't know if it would be necessary in this case. I mean, I'd probably give him something. I don't know if I'd give him socks, but maybe walk around. Okay. Matt, what would you do with it? I would use a tomidate. I would paralyze him to get my best view of the the uh, vocal cords. Uh, you know, he is going to be a difficult intubation because of C spine precautions. So make sure I've got a, a backup uh, method available, mm -hmm. glide scope. Uh, but take a, a primary look with my laryngoscope and, and use those medications. What do you think of um, what do you think about uh, Sean's concern about ra raising his ICP and this kind of things? Do you do do you do a I, bunch of adjunctive meds? I don't or? use any adjuncts. I know there is some uh, discussion about using lidocaine, but I don't think the evidence is out there that says that it does uh, alter your ICP. Uh, sure, any? So what are you using lidocaine for, or you know, you know, a maybe a a small dose of you know rock or something like that? What's the theory, anyways? So what's the theory of that? Yeah, yeah, you know how we used to, at least we used to do a prolonged thing where we thought somebody's ICP might be up, you know, we'd maybe give a, you know, a defasciculating dose of, you know, rock or something like that before we gave socks and we used to give a bit of fentanyl, maybe a bit of lidocaine. What was the theory? The was to decrease the ICP. Right, um, the response, right? You know, when you right. put the laryngoscope on the, the larynx, then your ICP would go up and try and blunt some of that, maybe with the paralyzation. But I think that's probably going by the wayside, right, correct? I believe, I believe yeah. so. I, I know some people still may use it, but I don't think the evidence says that you have to. It's just another step in the whole process. I think it slow things down. I still would use a Tominate um, for what it's worth, and then I would use Rock as well. Just to yeah, I think that whole discussion yeah, has, has moved past, and that it's, it's, it's only theoretical, and, and even the theory has been attacked. So I think that you would forget about all that stuff. I don't think any of us do that anymore, the fentanyl, the small dose of rock or whatever, and you just go ahead and do what you normally do. I would agree with you guys to intubate, you know, give him something. I don't really care so much about sedation, I guess, because he is unconscious. You know, the reason we use sedation is because it's no fun to be intubated and paralyzed when you're awake. 
It's because if you're GCS3, you can give a little bit of something, but I would definitely parallelize them with Rigor to Matt that, you know, you want your best view. And this guy could be struggling, thrashing, and by definition, it's already going to be a difficult airway. Someone's going to be holding in line tracks. So it's going to be difficult for you to get into pitch shell. All right. So, moving on. So, we did use Atominate and Sucks, and I got the tube in, so it couldn't have been that difficult. Uh, so, Sean was right, ABCs, first thing, vitals, physical, x rays. So, we did all those things. Uh, here's his chest x ray. Uh, you can see that he's intubated there. I'd barely like to comment on that. I don't know, the tube looked like he was in a good position. I don't see any pneumothoraces or pneumothoraces. I don't see rib fractures. I don't really know that. You design them. I mean, it, it looks a little bit wide to me, but it's a portable, so I can't really say anything about it. Yeah, but yeah, certainly, would, you know, that doesn't look normal, right? <coughs> you can certainly keep in the back of your mind that, I mean, who's kidding me? You're probably scanning this guy from head to toe if you can. All right, and what about this? Any concerns with that, Chris? Uh, yeah, there's a glaring. The symptoms is definitely disarticulated. Uh, pelvis is. Obviously, therefore, the volume of the pelvis is a lot larger than it should be. So, if there's any uh, uh, blood in the abdomen, it could be uh, increasing the volume of that and it could bleed out quite frequently. How does it get disarticulated at the uh, syphilis pubis? I think that's, uh, I think the mechanism of injury for that is usually uh, AP compression. Okay, so is that the only spot that it's injured? <coughs> um, no, then it could also be injured. Um, around the SI joints. Right, and you can see it looks different on the one side, it's a little wider. Uh, so management, so we talked about a few things. So we want to intubate fluids, blood, um, permissive hypotension, that's another, that's a whole uh, grand rounds by itself, so we won't get into that. Obviously needs a pelvic binder. Um, this guy needs to go to surgery, but uh, at this point, when does embolization come into play, or does it come into play with uh, this case? He's unstable, uh, multiple injuries. Um, likely head injury. What was the FAST scan? The FAST was positive. <laughs> um, so the patient uh, was hemodynamically unstable. He was uh, taken to the OR for a trauma lap and a pelvic stabilization. He had bilateral chest tubes in the OR. Uh, laparotomy had a grade three liver lack that was packed. Abdomen was left open and a vac dressing applied. He was taken back to the ICU. Um, something else I want to point out on uh, this chest x-ray. with uh, When you look at this, we look at this area that you can then correlate to the CT, the same area. So I thought that was, oops, very interesting that um, it's a liver lack that was visible on plain film. Anyway, so ortho also applied an X-fix. Um, problem with this patient is that he continued to bleed um, in the ICU, so then he was taken to IR for successful um, urgent iliac and bilateral pedendal embolization. So this guy went later, that's one of the indications, um, so he was initially unstable, continued to bleed. Um, so we'll get more into that. It's case two, 40-year-old um, male, he was an unbelted driver, he swerved to avoid hitting another vehicle, rolled his car several times, he was ejected from the vehicle, apparently flew 100 feet according to bystanders. Um, this guy it comes in, he's alert and oriented times three, he's GCS 15, he's in a C-spine collar, breathing normally. Um, there, there is vitals, um, you know, looks not too bad considering uh, what happened. Um, so, done with him, he's complaining of pain to his left shoulder blade and right hip. He's got an avulsion laceration in his ear. Um, abdomen is firm to palpate but not tender. There's an obvious right leg deformity. Um, Burke, anything concerning about that history? Well, first of all, I'll make sure this is the right patient because suppose he was thrown 100 feet from his car and he's talking to us. But it's the right that, patient. If that is true, um, things that concern me is he's having shoulder blade pain and he has what looks like either a pelvic or abdominal injury. So it makes me wonder if something actually irritating the diaphragm. So that area makes that in itself worries me and I would like to put an ultrasound on him. Just take a look in there, especially with the firm abdomen. And then the right leg deformity, I don't know if this is like a femur deformity, or like a tib-fib deformity, or if it's just some rotated legs. It makes me wonder, is this 
actually another reason to suspect a pelvis fracture, and I do want some pelvis imaging as well. All right. So, um, also needs fluid. so this guy has a positive test. What do you want to do? Is he lower his vital? Sorry, I forget now. And his repeat set stays the same, like so over 15 minutes, he's not starting to get doesn't, doesn't really add too much. I'd probably put him through the CT scanner first of all and try to make a decision there whether he should be going for something, an exploratory lab, or if he should be going for embolization with this, especially if a public x-ray that says there is definitely deformity there. Okay, good. So that's what happened. So CT results, he has a grade 5 splenic lac, a left scapular fracture, so that... Uh, Scapular pain may or not have been uh, significant, but um, right subtrochanteric femur fracture, a right ear laceration, um, some rib fractures, and a T12 compression fracture. So this guy went on for embolization based on that. Um, this is the IR note that there was classic uh, celiac axis anatomy. In the spleen, there's a large wedge-shaped avascular area from the hilum to the dome of the spleen. And they did a proximal splenic artery embolization um, successfully performed with an amplatser uh, amp, amp plug, which we'll talk more about later. So this is um, the view from the IR suite. So we're looking at uh, this area here. And then after the uh, embolization, we see that that area is no longer extravasating. Um, so, and just the other, uh, the other injuries, he had a uh, proximal femoral nail, he had his spleen embolized, um, he had an instrumented uh, fusion of his spine, and he had his uh, ear repaired. So, overview what we're going to do, so we went through a couple of cases, so we're going to look at some specific injuries today, liver, spleen, pelvis, um, we're going to go over a review of embolization, quick look at the literature, and then uh, some discussion. So, liver trauma. So, it's often cited as the most frequently injured abdominal organ in blunt trauma and the second most commonly injured in penetrating trauma. I say often cited because I saw a few different places where I uh, said the spleen was most and they actually commented that even though sometimes the liver is cited as the most, it's the spleen. So, either one of those two is the most common <laughs> injured uh, area in blunt trauma. So, that's uh, obviously a very rudimentary picture, but just a re reminder of how big the liver can span, especially if you have a, a drinking problem, but it goes all the way over into the uh, left uh, lower thorax and down past the uh, rib cage. So it spans a pretty big area here, so it's a pretty good target. Um, history physical findings are very nonspecific um, for this, so, but you can have right upper quadrant pain, seatbelt sign, generalized abdominal tenderness, but none of those are specific for liver injury. Um, Meg, what's a seatbelt sign? Uh, like when you have bruising or pain along the, where the seatbelt would have been placed on the person they're driving. Yeah, so I googled seatbelt sign, and that's the first thing that came up. Um, but I think that's a different seatbelt sign. Um, this is the appropriate seatbelt sign, so you see coming down across the uh, right shoulder. Um, so where was this, this guy, driver or passenger? What country? <laughs> Glad someone picked up on that. Um, all right, so uh, with a fast, uh, what you would see with this, you'd have a black rim of uh, subcapsular fluid, intraperitoneal fluid, or fluid in Morrison's pouch. And just keep in mind that a negative fast does not rule out a liver injury and that you have serial exams, um, especially if there's anything concerning uh, tachycardia, hypotension mechanism, so you need to uh, keep an eye on that. Um, this is a, a fast of the right upper quadrant, so everything's labeled nicely for us here. So we see the liver, the kidney, and then the uh, arrows with the uh, black line at the interface indicating free fluid. Um, so how do we evaluate these people? So CT, CTA, um, obviously ultrasound, I didn't even bother putting it up because that's just kind of part of practice now, especially with trauma, and I had already shown the pictures. Um, DPL, that's um, still on the algorithm, that does happen once in a while, there's one that happened last summer. Um, embolization can be uh, diagnostic and therapeutic, and then um, OR can also be uh, diagnostic and therapeutic. 
I think DPL is coming off the ATLS algorithm in the new year. Probably should. Anyone speak to that? No? Well, I mean, the fast ultrasound is, is the same thing, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> the DPL's only utility is in the unstable hypotensive trauma patient, right? It's, it's a, a quick decision. Do I need to go to the OR or not? So, yes, we fool around a lot with the fast ultrasound looking for things in a stable patient, but it's kind of irrelevant. The real first use for ultrasound was, does this patient need to go to the OR? Hypotension, positive fast equals OR. So it should take the place of DPL. Yes, it should. EPL shouldn't be there. I've seen a couple of surgeons do because they don't believe the fast. Yeah, so, but it's pretty darn rare. Yeah. We, we don't. We haven't done those very often at all. They're no fun to do, and you know it's very hard. They're not very accurate. Okay. All right. Uh, so, grading of liver injury. It's from uh, one to six. So you have different gradings for hematomas and lacerations. So, grade one hematoma, subcapsular, non-expanding, less than ten centimeters. And that goes all the way up to a ruptured uh, hematoma, which is a grade four. And then the lacerations are anything from a capsular tear, less than a centimeter, um, up to uh, greater than 75% of a lobe. And then grade six is a com complete just hepatic avulsion. So that's uh, very bad news. Um, these are the guidelines from the West uh, traumas, uh, trauma guidelines, um, looking at management of a adult blunt hepatic trauma. So the thing that we're interested for in this talk um, is going to be right here with the embolization. Um, so how do we get there? So we have our initial assessment, which uh, we did with these guys, um, the juniors. So um, you have abdominal exam, vital signs. Do they respond to the resuscitation? Um, if they're hemodynamically unstable, fast, negative, then consider other things. Um, go down this route, fast positive, then you go to the OR. If they're hemodynamically stable, um, you usually have time to get a CT scan. You see a liver injury and there, there's blush, which uh, we're going to talk about in a little bit as well. Uh, then they go for embolization, unless they become uh, unstable beforehand. Um, then other, other things, if they have blush, or they don't have blush, sorry, they observe, but then you have continued transfusion requirements or they're unstable, at that point you'd also consider um, embolization. Uh, splenic trauma, um, again, it's conflicting whether the spleen is, or liver is injured more often, but uh, regardless, so more, uh, you know, it's smaller, um, it's kind of better a little better protected because it's sitting behind a few structures here, but uh, still, um, let's see, injured fairly often. Uh, again, nonspecific signs, symptoms, you have left upper quadrant pain, generalized pain, you can have the contusion, the seat belt sign again. Uh, Natalie, do you know what Kerr's sign is? Okay, Burke? I already asked you something. All right, Kate? Is Kerr's sign the shoulder type of pain? Yeah. With uh, like diaphragmatic irritation from free fluid. Which one? Which shoulder? Yeah. Well, that. So our, uh, our second case had this, but he also had a scapular fracture. So it's uh, hard to tell whether it was Kerr's <laughs> sign or the scapular <laughs> fracture. So, All right, so this, of course, is a lunar eclipse. Um, no, kidding. Um, so it's a fast of a left upper quadrant. So see the spleen here. It's not labeled quite as nicely as the other one, but we have the free fluid coming around here, indicative of uh, positive scan. So grading of a splenic injury, so we have grade uh, one through five again, uh, or sorry, not again, the, one was, the other one is six. So uh, one, you know, hematoma uh, is less than 10% of the area. Uh, LAC is also less than one centimeter, so easy to remember between the two. And that goes up to a uh, grade three hematoma would be subcapsular greater than 50% of the area. And um, then the grade five would be a completely shattered spleen um, and then you can have a hilar vascular injury that uh, completely devascularizes the spleen. Um, again, going back to the West guidelines um, on uh, blunt uh, splenic injury, which is uh, quite interesting because um, embolization isn't on here. So we have uh, you know, FAST, we have a diagnostic peritoneal aspiration, um, CT scan observation, OR, embolization isn't on here. But um, 
it's uh, something that is locally practiced, and I'll talk more about the local practice uh, a little bit later, but I thought that was, uh, that was interesting. Um, pelvic trauma. So our first guy obviously had a very significant pelvic trauma, had, uh, quite a wide pelvic diastasis. Uh, blunt trauma can produce complex fractures that can result in severe hemorrhage. Then you have to consider is it stable versus unstable, that's both the patient and the pelvis. Um, is it open or is it closed? Um, evaluation, so same things, fast uh, x-ray, CT, OR, embolization. Um, fast to the pelvis, so we see the bladder here, and then uh, free fluid up in this area. So that's what a positive pass in the pelvis looks like. This is the uh, young Burgess classification of pelvic fractures. This was actually on the site exam, our first year that we did it. Um, so the uh, first one, the A1 through 3 is uh, lateral compression. Um, B, you have a uh, AP compression, and C is a vertical shear injury. So our guy um, probably had a B3 um, based on this uh, classification. Um, other injuries they can get frequently uh, with pelvic fractures, uh, urethral injuries, bladder rupture, iliac vessel injury, rectal, vaginal injury, perineal injury, um, various nerve injuries. Um, next thing we're going to talk about is uh, preperitoneal pelvic packing. So this is a surgical procedure in which laparotomy sponges are placed into the preperitoneal space to tamponade bleeding. And this reduces the available volume of the space. It's performed through a small suprapubic incision. Um, this is a cartoon of what it looks like. Has anyone seen this done? You are? No, I haven't either. I don't think it's done very often around here. But um, so the management of pelvic fracture, this is again the West guidelines um, with uh, hemodynamic instability. So here, um, embolizations over in this area. So if we're looking at um, if they're stable, you get your CT, CT is positive, and there's blush, then you go to embolization. Um, and then if they're not stable, and you give the uh, massive transfusion protocol here. You have a positive fast or a, a DPL, DPA, they call it here. Um, you don't have that, then you can do uh, packing, then embolization, um, once you stabilize them, or vice versa. Um, so that's uh, when you consider embolization there. So, and I'll have this spelled out clear later. Um, this is from the uh, trauma.org guidelines um, of uh, exsanguinating, exsanguinating pelvic injuries. So it's pretty similar, um, just not as complicated. So if they're uh, stable, then you move down here. If they're not stable, um, is it intraperitoneal or external hemorrhage? Um, then you go to the OR if it's not. And they suggest if you can get to angio in less than 30 minutes, go to embolization. If you can't, go to the OR. So that's what their suggestion is. But I don't think uh, we're going to get to there in 30 minutes. Uh, it's going to be pretty rare unless they're there waiting. In the middle of the night, that's going to be rare. Mm -hmm. It's important to remember that the fast is, is negative in that instance. Mm -hmm. right. And we have West guidelines. We also have East guidelines. Um, which patients warrant angio and uh, embolization? So you have a pelvic fracture, ongoing bleeding after non-pelvic uh, sources of blood loss have been ruled out. Um, pelvic fractures who have bleeding in the pelvis, which can't be controlled at laparotomy. So if uh, OR is unsuccessful or partially successful. Um, and patients with uh, evidence of arterial extravasation of IV contrast in the pelvis on CT. So a question about this, because I think I've, I've actually seen this case of pressure. If you have a patient who has an indeterminate fast, goes from stable to unstable, you know the time you have a <coughs> scanner, would you recommend they go for, and they do a pelvic fracture, you know the pelvic fracture, yeah. an intermittent fast, goes from stable to unstable, would you say go to OR or go to angio? Well, um, talked to Neil Perry about that situation, and his thought, you know, he's a uh, general surgery, not ortho, but his thought was uh, that if that happens, and you can get to, or ortho is around, um, and you can get to them in a timely fashion, then they should get an X-fix. Um, and if ortho isn't around, then you go to embolization or vice versa. So basically, whichever one you can get to first is what his thought was based on that. 
but you don't know what's going on. No, they have a pelvic fracture. They have a negative or indeterminate fast. They have an obvious pelvic fracture. We have an x-ray with that. Okay. Well, I mean, just get to your question, Burke. I mean, you would never take that patient to CT scanner, right? Because you mentioned CT or OR. Never okay. Well, you never see my scanner. Would you go, I'm yeah. going to do OR or angio. I, you wouldn't go to CT. I'm not sure what the indeterminate fast means, but you just can't get a good look. You just can't get a good look. <clears throat> you can't get a good look, then, yeah, you would deal with the pelvis. But I don't, I don't know that anybody would be excited to have that patient leaving the, the trauma suite. You could get ortho down, say, because there are lots of pelvic fractures that aren't amenable to a binder or an X-fix. That quite often happens. So you get them down, look at the x-ray, look at, is this one amenable or not? And if it's not, then you'd have to go someplace else. Or look for other, you know, other places that the fluid could be, obviously. Assume it's hemo, you know, it's hypovolemic, look in the chest, try and repeat your fast, um, and resuscitate, um, and look for other sources of where the blood could be, like, you know, a femur or loss of the scene or something along those lines. Okay, so management approach. Um, so again, these are the questions you have to ask. Is it uh, operative or non-operative? Um, are they stable or unstable, um, the patient and the injuries, the pelvis? Uh, it's also going to be surgeon dependent and facility dependent. Depends on the equipment, staffing, um, who's available, and that kind of thing. So what I've talked about a few times now is um, blush. So blush sign is an active pooling of contrast. Um, I said spleen, it's obviously not just spleen, um, with or around um, any vessel, sorry, that shouldn't be there, during um, IV enhanced uh, CT. So this is an example of blush, obviously this isn't a spleen. Uh, so here, see the extravasation, and I don't think it shows up that well, but that corresponds to where the uh, fracture is seen on the plane film here. And Oh, sorry, sorry about the uh, quality of the picture. Um, this is another example. This is um, in the lung. So, all right, so embolization. So like I said, I was hoping to have um, Dr. Cribs or one of the IRs here to talk about this. But um, anyway, the bleeding sites are controlled by using uh, intraarterial catheters to selectively place thrombotic agents into branches of arteries that are feeding the area of the bleeding. Um, embolization is known to be less effective if, of, uh, if the bleeding is of venous origin. So who would be a candidate for embolization? Um, they have low blood pressure in spite of adequate fluid, blood recess. Um, a retroperitoneal bleed would be uh, someone to be a candidate. Or uh, if they have blush, active contrast, extravasation um, from an arterial bleed. So what do they use? I'm going to go over this very quickly because I don't, this is stuff I just um, read. I don't have any experience with it. So there's liquid embolic agents, um, which is a permanently act, permanent rapid acting fluid. Gets an exothermic reaction, destroys the vessel wall. There's sclerosing agents, uh, which harden the endothelial lining of the vessels. It requires more time to react. Cannot use for high flow vessels. So that's probably not the best option for um, our purposes for trauma. Um, there's particulate embolic agents such as gel foam. These are used um, often. They're thought to temporarily occlude vessels for five weeks, but sometimes can be, uh, provide permanent uh, hemostasis. It absorbs liquid, plugs the vessels. Um, they're composed of water insoluble gelatin. So particles travel distally and occlude uh, smaller capillaries. Uh, main disadvantage of the, is the size is not uniform and uh, disruption of the clot with re-bleeding is possible. Um, there's also coils, mechanical occlusion devices. They're used um, often for arterial AVF, uh, aneurysms, or uh, trauma. It's so arterial venous fistulas. Um, an amplatzer plug, um, that's what was used in our second case uh, with the spleen um, laceration or spleen injury. So um, it's a multi-segmented, uh, multi-layer design. It reduces the time to occlude um, for uh, transcatheter embolization procedures. You have a three lobes, and it conforms to the vessel landing zones. Um, the six layers of mesh, which gives a, rapidly, a relatively rapid time to vessel occlusion. And it's used to occlude larger vessels uh, that would have required numerous coils. So that's what's going to be uh, good for a trauma situation. And it's also good for uh, during uh, aneurysm repair uh, for including the portal vein. So that's what that looks like. So 
not sure if you need to dwell on that. Um, coiling is another option. Um, this is someone that was um, coil. This is from uh, a case in the literature where there's a renal uh, renal uh, bleed here. There's the um, blush, and then we have this is a CT scan that was done several months later. Just so there's a little bit of scarring, but uh, looking pretty good. And this is actually the repair, and you can see the little coils being uh, put in here to uh, decrease the bleeding, stop the bleeding. So a little bit about uh, the literature, what the literature says on um, these things. So with respect to liver injuries, um, this was one study, it's 183 patients, blunt hepatic trauma. They did embolization, embolization in 23 uh, of the patients. Um, not sure why it says 79%. Um, and so the basic uh, results from this, oh, sorry. Um, was that um, successful management of injuries grade three and upward um, usually involves angio and surgical approach. Um, and you need to know about the ischemic complication. So basically anything that's uh, in this study, um, they did control bleeding in all of the cases, but the higher their injury, uh, the higher the grade of the injury, the more likely that you need to have surgery and embolization, which uh, is kind of intuitive. So spleen injuries, so this is uh, patients admitted spleen injuries over an eight year period. Um, this was observation, embolization, or surgery. The first four years, um, embolization wasn't used as much as the last four. Um, there's 304 patients period one, 416 in period two. They went non-operative 60% in period one, 59.9 uh, and 60.1 in period two. Um, not surprisingly, there's more uh, embolization performed in the uh, second group, 13.7 versus uh, 4.9. And this did reduce uh, the proportion of splenic operations, so 35% versus 26%. So they concluded that um, as an adjunct uh, to non-operative management of splenic injuries, that it did decrease the need for surgery. Um, but there was no overall changes in the failure rate of non-operative management, except in patients with grade two injuries. Um, pelvic. So, so retrospective analysis of pelvic fracture. There wasn't a whole lot of um, information on this. There's only this is only a 19 uh, patient series, um, and 19 of them went uh, had embolization. The technical success was 100%. Um, 14 out of 19 were stable after embolization. And the, um, oh, sorry, sorry, I thought I had more on that. Um, so basically it was 100% uh, effective and um, 14 out of the 19 were stable after the embolization, but that obviously means that five weren't and they needed to go on for something else. Um, now this was an interesting study. So it's the management of exsanguinating pelvic trauma. Do we still need the radiologist? So that's obviously uh, a surgeon that wrote this. Um, so there's 200 uh, polytrauma patients. There's initial phase of recess. Unstable pelvic fractures were treated with a circumferential belt or a binder, um, followed by an X-fix. And they had um, angio with all patients with uh, persistent hemodynamic instability. So that's, uh, 47%. Uh, so the mortality, sorry. Um, so the mortality rate of these patients with severe hemorrhage was uh, 33%. And basically, th there was very poor um, reporting in this study. And I couldn't make a whole lot of heads or tails, to be honest. And so basically, they did not recommend um, embolization. Because um, several of them, two, two of them uh, had a laparotomy first. Um, two of them had a uh, X-fix, which controlled the bleeding just by itself. And five out of 15 of them um, died. So they thought uh, some major drawbacks were noted. Um, venous bleeding treatment, um, the availability of the, uh, and how long the embolization procedure uh, takes. That's going to be obviously uh, dependent on um, what facility you have, what they're using to uh, embolize with, and that uh, the preperitoneal packing is fast and effective surgical alternative. Um, another one, the uh, 
peritoneal packing versus embolization. So there's 11 in the packing group, 13 in the angio group. Uh, the mean time to intervention in angio was longer than the packing, so it took longer to get to the angio suite than the OR, but that wasn't significant. Mortality in the angio group was higher than the packing group. Um, they had three people that died in the embolization group, one person in the uh, packing. So they thought that early pelvic packing with subsequent angio, um, if needed, is as good as angio with embolization in treating patients with um, hemodynamically unstable pelvic fractures. So they thought either one could be useful in this case. Uh, locally, what do we do here? So uh, most of this is based on uh, my uh, discussion with uh, Dr. Cribbs and Dr. Perry. Um, so obviously they're, uh, what we're concerned about is trauma patients and generally speaking, unless there happens to be no TTL, um, it's going to be uh, TTL involvement and we're not going to be calling them up um, as eMERGE physicians unless uh, we're thrust into the role of TTL or obviously one of the uh, eMERGE docs is a TTL. Uh, generally, they are stable. If they're unstable, they uh, should be going to the OR, generally speaking, but it does happen from time to time that, uh, that if they go to the OR and they're still unstable afterwards, then they'll go to uh, angio. So that's the, uh, the difference with the stable and unstable. Um, if they have a CT, which they usually should because they're usually the stable ones, uh, you see blush on CT, that's an indication to go to the angio suite. Uh, liver, most are managed non-operatively. Um, it's not as successful as spleen embolization. That's due to the uh, dual blood supply of the liver. So uh, those don't get done as, as often as the uh, spleen or pelvis. Um, spleen um, does well. Um, some good uh, success rates for that. It's most often um, organ embolized here in trauma. Um, pelvis, this is, uh, we kind of alluded to this uh, earlier with uh, Burke's question. This is. So we kind of discussed this already. So if they have a uh, pelvic fracture and they're hypotensive and nothing in the abdomen, if um, ortho is there to put on an X-fix, if that can be done, they do that. Um, or times they'll go to the angio suite um, initially and um, have that done. Or if uh, ongoing hypotension and ortho is not available, that at that point you'd consider um, angio. And just some other odds and ends that uh, have been done, um, glutes, abdominal wall, um, usually doesn't need embolization even with uh, blush because it's uh, most likely going to wall off itself according to uh, Dr. Perry. Um, so these ones they usually um, observe and there's higher complication rates with this of uh, necrotic tissue and that kind of thing. So that's it. <laughs>